Hello and welcome to the Reviews Brothers, where we've been looking at the A to Z of PS2 hidden gems. We've covered a ton of games and still have a way to go. The letter O was actually an interesting one, with a few more games than I was expecting that could be included, but I think I've got a few that you probably haven't heard of. So how about I shut up, you press that subscribe button, and we take a look at some games. We are going to start underwater with Ocean Commander, a very budget title that looks like it could be a free flash game rather than a PS2 title, kind of like the games that PopCat released on the Xbox 360. Remember them? Heavy Barrel was great. Anyway, in Ocean Commander you take control of a submarine with a face that is on a mission to kill all the evil submarines and robots that are being dickheads in the ocean. You've got 21 levels to play through that take you through various parts of the ocean, though they all play basically the same. The screen automatically scrolls to the right and enemies will constantly appear, bombarding you with lasers, rockets, torpedoes and more. But of course you aren't helpless and have plenty of weapons of your own. You control the ship's movement with the left analog stick and a crosshair with the right one, meaning you can attack in any direction that you want. You get a ton of weapons from lasers of your own, rockets, missiles, homing missiles, torpedoes, bombs and more. Most of these will need to be bought before you can use them. Killing enemies gives you money and between levels you can visit a shop where you can buy these new weapons, as well as upgrade the ones that you have, making them more powerful or increasing their speed or the number of shots fired etc. You also get a few other things you can buy, like permanent speed ups or an increase to your health. It's nice having so much to choose from and sometimes it's worth not buying anything for a couple of levels so you can save up for the more powerful stuff. As the levels progress you get more and more enemy types, most of which are based on fish or other sea creatures but in a robot form, and you'll need a variety of weapons to make sure you can take them all out easily enough. At the end of each stage there's always a massive boss, and these take up most of the screen, but they don't have any weak points or anything like that, it's just a case of shooting them and hoping that they die before you do. Though it's not a very hard game, so the chances are you'll be winning most of the time. The graphics are very basic. As I said, it looks like a flash game, so it's not impressive at all, really. Same with the sound and music. This definitely didn't cost much to make. But the controls are solid, and the gameplay does exactly what it sets out to do. If you play this over a few sessions, you'll probably find that it's more fun than it should be. Another 2D sprite based game, but one that is definitely not a budget game, is Odin Sphere from Vanillaware. There's a lot of plot for this game, which is divided up into a few books that are being read by a girl, telling the stories of a number of wizards, warriors, kings, queens and evil doers. Each one tells the tale of various characters that are in the middle of various wars, and you play the part of the main character of each book, fighting through the battles. Luckily they all tend to be sexy women. It's all set in a 2D world where you only need to worry about losing left and right. After a whole lot of story, you eventually go into a battlefield where various enemies will teleport in and your one job is to kill all the enemies. Simple, right? Each character plays slightly differently in terms of their attacks, but the basics here are the same. You've got your standard combos, as well as attacks that launch enemies into the air, and crouching attacks that are usually used to attack an enemy that has a shield and blocks anything that attacks their body. You do have to be careful, as the attacks have to play out their animations before you can start a new one, or even block, which is done by holding down the attack button. And some of the animations do go on for quite a while, making it easy to take damage while you get used to it. But that's when you realise that you aren't meant to play this game as a button masher. Instead, you've got to be careful with your attacks. There is a map on the screen that shows you where enemies are, and you'll want to watch this carefully. The devils loop continuously, so you can never get to the end of one. They're like one big circle, letting you attack enemies from behind if you're fast enough. Killing things will make them drop various items or chests containing stuff that you need, like money, health, power-ups and even magic. You get a few magic spells, and enemies will also drop orbs when they die, which you need to hold L1 to attract to you. This will level up your character and makes your attack stronger. Most items need to be used via a menu system, which is a little clunky at first, but when it's used to it, it works fine. Thankfully, the action also pauses when you're in this menu. You do have to be careful when you're fighting though, as you do have a power meter. This is actually a stamina meter, really, as when it runs out, you'll be exhausted and you can't move for a few seconds while it recharges, and to get it to recharge, you have to be standing still. So sometimes you'll want to do a few combos, run away and recover, and then get back to the action. It sounds like it would be annoying, but I actually never found it to be a problem. 
When you finish a level, you're given a choice of exits represented by dots on the circle in the bottom right of the corner. These are all connected to different parts of the level and you'll need to choose your exits carefully so you can level up and find enough items before taking on the bosses. You'll find a map soon enough or you can buy one from the various merchants you come across which will show you what to expect on each of the stages, so if there's tough enemies or an item you need, you'll be able to find out. Graphically, the game is awesome, with Vanillaware's classic look and sprite designs. Most of the characters have strange proportions, but I really like their style and animation. It is a single player game which is a bit of a shame as it would be good fun with a friend, but even so, as a single player action beat em up, it's great fun with a lot of story, great gameplay and a fantastic look. It's also a hell of a lot cheaper than I expected it to be, and I feel like it's one of those games that I can see going for crazy prices in the future, so I would definitely recommend grabbing a copy while you can. Okagi Shadow King is a really cool RPG that got me totally hooked pretty much as soon as I started playing it. You play as a kid that you get to name and you live in a sleepy town with your cute family. Some boring stuff happens and you find out that the monsters have appeared. Shock. Thankfully your granddad has a strange bottle that he says can help. You open this bottle and an evil Shadow King hell bent on conquering the world appears, but being a shadow he has to affix himself to a host which of course turns out to be you. After helping save your sister from a curse to prove that he really does have powers, you then find out that a load of other evil spirit kings have appeared and that's where all these monsters are coming from. So you set off to kill them all so you can take over the world by yourself and prove that you're the strongest shadow king. But as you can imagine, it doesn't all plan out. In terms of gameplay, it plays like your fairly standard RPG. You'll explore towns where you can buy items, weapons and get various tasks from the townsfolk to complete earning you even more money, items and stuff. Then you have an overworld where you explore to find new towns and locations where the other evil spirits are. This is where you get your random battles against various monsters and ghosts, and it turns out that your evil ghost king spirit thing blokey wasn't joking when he said he was tough. He can kill most monsters pretty easily, but as you're his subordinate, he forces you to do most of the fighting which is done in a turn-based fashion. You choose who you want to attack and how you want to attack them, and then you press a few buttons. You know, usual RPG stuff. As you play, you'll level up, getting stronger, and you'll meet new people along the way that will join you on your quest, each with their own powers. There's really nothing out of the ordinary in terms of gameplay, but what makes the game so damn charming is its sense of humour and writing. Stan, which is the evil Shadow King's name by the way, does his best to be evil and terrifying, but absolutely no one believes that he's an evil ruler and just laugh and jokes with him, but it's done really well, and every time you do something to show your evil power, it always ends up accidentally benefiting whoever he's trying to scare, making them really like him and not fear him. Like early on, you're in a town that has one of the evil ghosts, and it cuts the town's water supply off, and is the most terrifying thing the villagers have seen. So, to prove that you're more powerful, you go and kick the shit out of this monster. But instead of the villagers being scared of you, you're now their hero, and it makes him furious. Now, I'm pretty sure we can all see where this is going story-wise a mile away, but I still like the way it's done. The game looks really decent with a cartoony style, and it works very well for a game like this, and I really like all the wacky designs for the characters. It was actually never released in the UK, which is probably why I'd never heard of it until this video, so if you do want to play it, you'll probably have to sail the seven seas like I did, but I reckon it's well worth it. Booby time now with One Chan Bara Bikini Samurai Squad. Now this is a series of games that is still being made to this day, and you can see why. Here you get to take control of one of two Bikini Samurai Zombie Hunters, and the story is really nothing more complex than there are zombies and monsters being brought to life by an evil magician, so you gotta go and stop them. This is part of the Simple series on the PS2, which is a budget line of titles that has a few surprisingly enjoyable ones, and this is one of them. Not just for the obvious reasons. I should really look at this whole series, really. It doesn't really matter which character you choose as they basically play the same, but what I do like is that you can change characters between levels, so you're never stuck with the same one for too long. Gameplay is simple, you're put in a fairly large maze-like level which is packed with enemies, and often a bunch of locked doors, so you've got to fight your way through the level until you get to the boss and defeat it. There's always dozens of enemies on screen for you to take out, but thankfully you don't actually always have to kill them and often there's really not much benefit in doing so, as you don't level up or anything. 
But if there's a locked door or magic barrier that you can't get past, then chances are you just need to kill everything to proceed, or at least kill everything until you find the enemy that was carrying the key that you needed, though they're never highlighted. Doing the killing is of course your main thing here. You've got a few combos you can do, and you always have a sword. It's mostly a case of button mashing. The sword will chop enemies to pieces, with a nice amount of blood splattering all over the place. You also have a kick button. This is very weak, but pushes enemies away, so it's actually pretty handy. If there's a large group of enemies, you'll want to start in there with a running kick. As it sends most of them flying out of the way, you can focus on just one or two at a time. You can block, and also lock onto a single enemy if you need to be focused, but I never really bothered with that to be honest. There's a few strange things that happen in the game though that can take a minute to get used to. Firstly, your sword has a blood meter showing how much blood is on it. If it gets too high, you'll do a lot less damage, and it will basically become blunt. Thankfully, you've got a handy dandy button that lets you shake the blood off your sword, so you just need to press that every few minutes to make sure you're doing maximum damage. Secondly, your character also gets covered in blood, which you can't really help. This builds up another meter, and when this is maxed out, you'll go into a blood rage mode, where the little squid dude attaches himself to your head for some reason, making you faster and do more damage, but your health will be constantly draining. To get rid of the blood on you, you either need to find an angel statue that are located around the levels, or you can find a smaller one that you can carry with you. You'll need to use this from your inventory to get back to normal, just don't ask me where she's keeping this stuff. Also, I'm pretty sure the squid is the final boss from Demolition Girl that you'll remember from the Letter D episode of this series. Now, while this is about as complex as the gameplay gets, it is still fun to run around killing stuff. I will say the levels do drag on way longer than they need to, with you needing to go back and forth between the same few rooms over and over. Some took me nearly half an hour to complete, even though they were quite small. You'll do a lot of running around empty streets, but when you do find the boss, they're usually fun to fight, and the game has a real campy B-movie budget game charm to it. It looks decent enough, and they've clearly focused on the right areas, and if you're a fan of hack and slash gameplay and knockers, then this might just be the game for you. More women that kick ass now with Oni, a game from Rockstar and Bungie. Yep, the people that made GTA and the Halo games work together on this one. And it's good, but really could do with a modern update. In Oni, you play as Konoko, not as Oni as I've assumed for my whole life, despite owning this game from the PC when it first came out. The story is worryingly realistic, being set in 2032, where the Earth has been devastated and there's very few hospitable places left. All nations have come together into a single entity with a totalitarian government. Shockingly, there are crime syndicates and the government are actually trying to help the world. That's probably the most unrealistic bit about the plot. But yeah, Kanoko is a badass agent sent on various missions to take down the criminal scum. The gameplay is all set up and level based, and pretty much old school in its presentation. You're given a briefing at the start of each level, giving you a vague idea of what it is you need to do, then it's up to you to explore the levels, to find your objectives, and complete them. These range from killing people, destroying things, hacking terminals, collecting data, and so on. Your usual spy stuff, but it's done well. It's pretty damn tough though, thanks to a few things. Firstly, it is very old school, so there's little hand holding and you'll need to explore every inch of the levels to look for keycards or computer terminals you'll need to use. There's no arrows pointing the way and no glowing items letting you know that you can interact with them. When I first started playing, I will admit that I was stuck a few times because I didn't realize there's a terminal that I'd run past a dozen times, which actually something I needed to interact with to open a nearby door. You will need to get used to it all. Secondly are the controls, which definitely take some time to get used to. There are loads of moves you can do in the game. Kanoko has a decent amount of punches, kicks, throws, dodges, jumps and more that you can do, with new moves being learned all the time. You can also be stealthy, which is often worth doing as enemies are tough. There is a training section of the game and I do highly recommend playing through this properly and really paying attention, or you could struggle as the game is definitely challenging, but I do really like it. The combat is surprisingly in depth and you'll want to learn it all. You do also have a range of guns and explosives that you'll get throughout the game as well, but ammo is very limited so you'll want to save these for emergencies. When you're fighting enemies, you can tell how damaged they are not only by their record collection, but also the colour of the blob that appears whenever you attack them, going from green down to red when they're nearly defeated. This is a nice way to do things. 
Enemies don't tend to respawn, which is good, as it makes it easy to know where you've been. And some of the level layouts will really need you to explore, as they are large and can often look a bit samey, even from level to level. Not a huge amount changes, but there's enough. I do really like the graphics here, you've got some really cool anime cutscenes which help with the story, and you can tell this is inspired by Ghost in the Shell, Akira, and things like that. It's great. The animation is excellent too, and it's one of those games that's begging for a remake or even a sequel, but let's face it, that'll never happen. So yeah, if you like challenging but fair games with some surprisingly deep mechanics, then this is definitely one you'll want to try. Time for a couple of games based on animated movies now, which I have to say are popping up a lot in these videos. I'm surprised at how many quite enjoyable licensed games there are on the PS2. Anyway, this one here is Open Season. I've never seen the film because it looks awful, but the game here is a half-decent platform adventure. You play as Boog, a tame bear who lives a peaceful life with his park ranger human buddy. Soon you meet Elliot, a deer who's been captured by a hunter, and he's your typical dickhead annoying side character that old people seem to think are appealing to kids, as he's a crazy wild animal and he'll get you into all sorts of trouble and you end up stuck in the wilderness with him trying to survive. The game has a few different styles of play and isn't a standard platform game, instead being more puzzle based where you have to complete various tasks to find your way home. You switch between Boog and Elliot, depending on what's going on, and they each have their own level styles and abilities. Boog's levels are generally more open 3D levels where you need to explore to find items or food to give to other animals. Basically, as you're new, all of the animals hate you, so you've got to do stuff to win them over and be friends with them. You can use Elliot to help though, usually by throwing him at things to knock stuff down or onto ledges where you can't normally get to so he can grab an item or something. Once you've done whatever task it is to make the animals like you, you can then actually use any of that creature that you find in future levels to help you out. So if you make friends with skunks, you can then use their stink to scare off hunters, squirrels will throw nuts, and so on. I actually really like this mechanic and think it would work really well in an open world style game. Come on Zelda, do that in the next one. If you're playing as Elliot, your levels pretty much always are speed based, with you running around like a madman completing various races and time trials. These are fine and a nice change of pace. Not long into the game, your main troubles come from hunters, and here is where the game turns more into a puzzler, as you've got to basically figure out how to scare them out of the wilderness. This is where you need your animal buddies as you can set up traps for the hunters, as well as sneaking around your stealth quite stealthily to get close to them and give them a big bear roar. It was actually surprisingly fun to do. Hunters won't always run away immediately though, so you kind of want to make combos, where you set up squirrels and skunks around the level and then go and roar at the hunters to make them run into the path of the squirrel who will then pelt them with nuts, much like Toby Von Doom on a Friday night, and then that will scare them into the path of a skunk who will finally chase away the bad guys with their asses. Also kind of like Toby on a Friday night. Huh. Listen to the Secret Levels podcast for more information on that. Anyway, the game is surprisingly fun. Combine that with some pretty good graphics that look just out of the movie, some tight control, and overall, you've got a kind of fun game. It is still aimed at kids, so don't expect a massive epic challenge, but if you take it for what it is, then you'll probably actually have a good time. Over the Hedge is based on a DreamWorks film that I did actually watch years ago, and I'm sure it's fine. Can't really remember it though. And the video game adaptation is another one that is surprisingly fun, being that it's based on a kid's movie. The plot here is that you're a bunch of animals that steal food from humans, they get kind of fed up with it and start sending out pest control, and some of your mates get captured. This means you've got to set out on a bunch of levels with various gameplay styles in order to rescue your friends, find food, and more importantly, find somewhere that you can live in peace. Surprisingly, most of the game is basically a 3D brawler. There's always two playable characters on screen, and about 10 or so that you can unlock as the game progresses. Sometimes you're forced to be certain characters if the levels require it. Each character does basically play the same though. You've got a variety of weapons that you can collect, and you'll be fighting them off evil vermin like rats, as well as various exterminators and their contraptions. This means you'll be a raccoon, skunk, tortoise or squirrel armed with a golf club going around smashing the shit out of other creatures. It's great. You can cave their skulls in with your club of choice and also have a ranged attack by holding down the button. You'll need to use this to hit various switches or break objects to progress. And of course, everyone can double jump. 
characters all basically play identically, with the only real difference being their special attack, which is always essentially a screen clearing attack, but with a different animation. And you get this by collecting the weird stuff that enemies drop. You can also smash most of the scenery, where you'll find DVDs to unlock secret movies or music tracks that you'll never watch or listen to, or you'll find power-ups that permanently increase your health or special meters. Now these are useful. There's also hats in the levels which give you various temporary stat boosts. When you're not bashing animals' heads in, you have a few mini-games you can play as well, like golf, as well as quick time events and even some racing stages. It's all actually done pretty well and is quite good fun, especially as the whole thing can be played in two-player. But if you haven't got another friend, you can always just switch between the two characters as often as you want. The game looks really good, again thanks to its cartoony roots. They already had a lot to work with here and I really like how it's all put together. None of the actual cast from the film do their voices, so the likes of Bruce Willis, Steve Carell and Avril Lavigne all have sound alikes which aren't great, but phew, they do the job. Overall though, this really is a surprisingly fun, if simple, action platform game that would be perfect to play with your kids and it kind of reminds me of the Lego games in terms of how it plays. If you prefer your stealth to involve guns, then you might like Operation Wimback, a third person action game that is actually a port of an N64 one, that's something you don't see every day. It's your typical covert ops story here with a bunch of terrorists from a fictional land turning up and causing all sorts of problems, so you and your team set out to shoot them all in the face, known here in the west as Justice. Each mission is fairly large but quite linear, you've got to clear out dozens of terrorists on each level and often have to find some sort of massive weapon to destroy or disarm it to stop it from being used for evil, although quite how you use something that's sole purpose is for murder for good, I'll never know. Justice. It's all played in third person and it's one of the earliest examples of a cover shooter that I can remember, at least the N64 one was. You'll need to get grips with quite a few controls here, and it did take me a while to get used to the cover mechanics, but really it's simple enough and I'm just stupid. You can snap to any cover, but be aware that if it's lower than you, you will need to manually crouch. This is the bit that took me a while to get used to it, as I'm not very smart. You can then lean out a number of ways in order to shoot enemies in the face. The game is very arcade-like, and you'll run into an area where a bunch of people will also be present, so you'll race to the find the cover, and you have a good old-fashioned shootout. You can't shoot from the hip, but there is a fairly generous lock-on system, which aims for the body, but you can adjust it if you want to make headshots or limb shots, where you can for instant kills. And you really have to be careful as you're no superman and you will die quite quickly if you're out in the open. Headshots even count against you, so you really need to change your position and how often you pop out of cover quite regularly. You do get a few weapons, there's your standard pistol, which is weak but still pretty damn accurate, a shotgun which is powerful with a wide spread, and your machine gun which is somewhere in between. More weapons come available as you play of course. Your pistol is the only one with unlimited ammo though, but you will find more on the corpses of your vanquished foes, as well as the crates that you can smash. You'll also find health kits, which is handy. I really like how the game looks, it does look like an upscaled N64 game and really gives off Dreamcast vibes, and you know me, I love Dreamcast graphics. It's just clean with some nice details and some very straight edges. The controls are a little stiff and definitely the part that you'll really need to get used to when playing this one, but they work and it's a fun game to play. You'll need to remember that it's not a run and gun and you do have to take this one a lot slower, take your time and take cover and make your attacks work if you really want to survive. It actually took me a few tries to even beat the first level, as I went in trying to play it like Doom Eternal. That definitely doesn't work. So yeah, if you like this sort of thing, or are a fan of the N64 original, then this will be one that you'll want to enjoy. Another RPG now with Orphan, Scion of Sorcery. You play as a kid called Orphan. Stupid name, but ah well. He has some magic powers and is a tough nut, so is asked to get some treasure for some easy money. You set sail on a boat only to be attacked by giant sea monsters, but it seems like the whole thing was a setup, so you set off with some other survivors in order to find out what the hell's going on and who's trying to kill you. Now this is an RPG, but it doesn't really play like many, or in fact any, that I've played before, but that's not saying much because I haven't played many RPGs. And it's all in 3D and you get to explore a bunch of locations. You'll see enemies all over the place, and for the smaller ones you can just attack them like you would in an action RPG, pressing the circle button with your sword or whatever weapon you have equipped to slash them. 
but if it's a bigger enemy or groups of enemies, then the game goes more like a traditional RPG with sort of turn-based battles, but not really. Basically, if it's a big enemy, the screen will freeze and you will go into a battle scenario. From here, you'll see yourself and any enemies and objects that you can interact with. Then, each button on the controller is assigned to either an attack or defensive move. You choose what you want to attack and then press the button of whichever attack that you want to do. For example, you might want to select one of the monsters and then X might be a flame attack, triangle might be thunder, circle could be your sword and square might be to block. What's cool is that it actually all kind of takes place in real time, so enemies will constantly come at you and do various attacks, and you need to time your attacks so they hit enemies while dodging their attacks. That's a lot of attacks. You can also block most things enemies throw at you, but this takes a few seconds to actually activate, which is deliberate and you really have to time everything perfectly. It takes a while to get used to and you'll often switch between characters who each have different attacks and powers. Enemies also have weaknesses, so you'll want to use lightning against water enemies and so on. There's a fair bit to get used to. You'll level up and get more powerful and have more health. You even learn new spells and attacks and can assign any that you want to any of the face buttons on the controller. Bosses especially look cool and you'll need to learn their animations as they play out like cutscenes, except you can still control your character and attack and defend. They aren't quite quick time events but kind of similar. When you're not battling you'll be exploring your usual array of RPG levels and locations looking for treasure as well as towns where you'll meet people to get quests or to visit shops and inns. There's even some platforming you'll need to do to get around the levels so be on the lookout for traps, spikes and bottomless pits. Thankfully you can save fairly often and I wasn't ever sent back too far when I died. The game looks decent enough with nice graphics and effects and I like a lot of the enemy designs here. The voice acting is of course terrible, kind of like you'd expect, and actually Orphan himself is a bit of a dick and not a very likeable character, but hey, he's the cool edgy protagonist, so what do you expect? I enjoyed what I've played with this game, I'm a few hours in. It does have some control issues, even when exploring, but it was nice to have a totally different style of gameplay to what I've played before. It definitely takes some time to get used to, but it's unique and fun if you're up for the challenge. And finally for today, here is Otto Staz, a very odd puzzle game that I hadn't heard of until making this video. And it's a strange but very addictive game, even though I'm not entirely sure what I'm still doing most of the time. I'll be honest, I'm not really sure how to describe this game. I guess it's kind of like Checkers, or that one where you place pieces of a different colour in diagonal fashion that take your opponent pieces. What does that one called? I can't remember. Anyway, in Otto Staz you have three types of piece. You have ground, water and tree. You can switch between them all as often as you like. Then you have a board with a bunch of squares on it. What you have to do, I think, is to put down a combination of ground, water and tree. So what you want is a ground tile to have a water one and a tree one touching it. This will make a house appear. Once a house has appeared, you're welcome to get rid of the tree and water in order to put down more suitable tiles. It's kind of confusing but makes sense when you're playing. If you've got a few houses together and put a ground tile next to them, they'll become two story houses. And this goes on for a while, basically placing different combinations of tile and it will let you build huge housing estates all over the board, which is essentially the aim of the game. The screen will eventually start scrolling on its own and you've got to make sure you've made enough houses by the time you get to the end of the level. And that's all there is to it really. Thankfully there is a very in-depth tutorial which you will absolutely want to complete. This game was only released in Japan, but it does have a full English text option here, something that I didn't know until after I'd played it for a few hours, as the option is written in Japanese and I didn't know it was telling me that I could change the language. Bugger. I really love the graphics here, it all looks like it's made out of paper and it really does look super charming, and it's got a really nice chilled out soundtrack as well. The controls, well, it's a puzzle game so they work fine, it's just a case of selecting squares and pressing a couple of buttons. I'd never heard anyone talk about this game, but I do highly recommend giving it a go. I know my explanation's been pretty shite, but once you start playing, you will get used to how it plays. Definitely worth checking out. So there you go, 10 games for the PlayStation 2 that you may not know about that start with the letter O. How many have you played and what other ones should I have included? As always, let me know in the comments below. Now, all that's left for me to say is thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.